It's a common question that comes up in various wilderness first aid courses. What should be in a backcountry medical kit? You don't want to be left in an emergency without the tools you need to handle the situation. However, in the backcountry, space and weight are limited and too much equipment can be a problem. One solution is to buy a pre-stocked kit commercially from your local outdoor store. And there is a lot of choice. A lot. And the dude at the store helping you is wearing the polyester vest, so he must know what he's doing, right? But what's in those kits? Does it match where you will be traveling, or does it match your skills? Don't get pulled into interventions based on your kit, rather than based on your skills and knowledge. I mean, what does that do, even? So, another solution. Uh, ask not what your med kit can do for you, but uh, what you can do that you need your med kit for is I'm sure what some important person said some time ago. Anyway, so to put together the kit that is right for you, start with what you know, then collect the items that you will need to perform those skills. Okay, here we go again. If you don't think disclaimers like this are necessary, you've met people, right? You know what people are like, right? And if you think a YouTube video is a sufficient preparation to provide emergency care in the backcountry, well, you really are part of the problem, aren't you, Sparky? So go get proper training. My kit, pictured here, is divided into modules. This allows some flexibility in where various components are packed on trip, allows for some redundancy in the case of loss or damage, and some scalability for the length and expected risk of the trip. The modules I use are an emergency kit, a main kit, and an ouch kit. My kit is only being used as an example and a starting point. Your kit should reflect your skill set and your working environment. We'll go over each module. At the end of each section there will be a contents list that you can screenshot to consult later. The emergency kit, also known as the oh shit kit. Consider stocking this section with everything you need to stabilize life threats. Ideally, it should keep your equipment safe, always be visible, accessible, and close at hand. In my case, I keep this section in a bright red fanny pack. You can call it a waste pack if it makes you feel cooler. But you don't need to. It's already awesome. Inside, the contents are in a hard, waterproof case. The waste pack allows me to keep it strapped to the outside and top of my expedition pack when hiking. Or on short trips, I can just take the waste pack with me. When I'm paddling, I can keep the waste pack strapped to the seat next to me. To decide what goes in your emergency module, think about the three critical systems, circulatory, respiratory, and nervous systems, and what problems might occur in the field. For the circulatory system, the primary concerns are a loss of pulse or a life-threatening bleed. Obviously, in the backcountry, your best tool to assist a patient found without a pulse is knowledge. Remember that resuscitation course you were going to take? To check for major bleeds, you are going to want examination gloves and possibly trauma shears in order to expose the area. In the event of a life-threatening bleed is found, you are going to need to stop it. Well-aimed direct pressure is often the best method. However, you will eventually need to free up your hands with a presser dressing, wound packing, or use of a tourniquet. Gauze will be required for wound packing, and a decent pressure dressing can be made in the field using a tensor bandage and either gauze or triangular bandages. Triangulars can also be used to form an impromptu tourniquet, but commercial tourniquets are light and compact. I would recommend a commercial tourniquet. Trauma pads may be useful, but are expensive. I carry feminine hygiene pads as a more affordable alternative. And finally, some Ziplocs to have somewhere to dispose of soiled first aid supplies might be handy. For the respiratory system, the thought process is much the same. The infield emergencies we may come across are a loss of airway and insufficient breathing. As with the circulatory system, knowledge is the best tool. However, a CPR face mask is a mandatory piece of kit to my mind. An airway adjunct such as a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway requires some training to learn how to insert, but can help maintain an airway by keeping the tongue from occluding the airway in an unconscious patient. 
to treat an acute asthma attack, which is disruptive to effective breathing, some medications will be required. At the risk of being repetitive, get proper training. And keep in mind that in the province of Ontario, some of these are prescription-only items. Salbutamol, also known as albuterol or Ventolin, or simply the rescue inhaler, is a medication that hopefully the patient has with them. If possible, it's a good med to have with you as well. In some training courses, there is a protocol to cover instances when a known asthmatic patient is not responding to the salbutamol inhaler. If you have this training, carrying prednisone and a means of epinephrine administration are good items to have handy. Emergency assessment of the nervous system in many protocols consists of determining if there is a decrease in consciousness or if there is a mechanism of injury that could compromise the spine. For spinal injuries and many causes of decreased consciousness, there's not a lot of equipment that will be helpful in the first critical moments of a rescue. However, there are a few items that you may want in the emergency section that can assist in treating the causes for decreased consciousness, notably hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and anaphylaxis. Some form of rapidly absorbed sugar that can be smeared onto a patient's gums to test and help treat hypoglycemia warrants a place in your kit. If you have to ask about insulin, then you have not taken that training course yet, have you? Get on that. In the meantime, just promise me you won't ever give insulin in the field to somebody with an altered mental state. Never ever. Hypothermia can lead to an altered mental status. In my kit, I do carry a compact reflective blanket. It is probably overkill since I will almost always have camping equipment or extra clothing to keep a patient warm. You could decide. Obviously, the treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. The dosing is the same as that for the asthma protocol that does not respond to salbutamol. So, it's repeated here along with the prednisone as a reminder rather than to indicate any difference from the respiratory medications. Added to the list is an antihistamine, such as diphenhydramine, which features in some anaphylaxis treatment protocols. So there you have an emergency kit. Don't forget your fanny pack too, so you can look awesome. Grow a mullet too. It'll totally help. In addition to the items discussed, you will note a few extras I tend to carry. A small notebook with soap note forms and a pencil, a small light, flint, striker, etc. Feel free to screenshot this frame and help begin your own list. Remember, it needs to be your kit. This is just a starting point of what I carry in mine. Now we come to the main kit. For me, this takes up a good 10 liter space. I have mine stored mostly in a commercial rollout first aid kit bag that fits inside a rugged 10 liter dry bag. This can live in the bottom of my expedition pack. It actually sits in the sleeping bag compartment of my pack, which displaces my sleeping bag to wherever the fuck I can fit it in. So what do I have in the main part of my kit? Truthfully, all the diagnostic equipment I carry could be considered as somewhat optional. I do carry a stethoscope, primarily for assessing lung sounds. Although, with a blood pressure cuff, it does allow for a determination of diastolic blood pressure. I also carry a blood pressure cuff, AKA a sphig, sphig, mom, sphig, uh, don't make me say it. Remember, with a blood pressure cuff, you can get a systolic blood pressure via palpation. In wilderness emergency medicine, the systolic pressure is the number that we are most interested in to ensure that shock is not an issue. I also carry a thermometer. However, I don't really feel the thermometer is useful in determining the degree of hyper or hypothermia. If you carry one, it is really for detecting if your patient is running a fever. On the newer fangled side of things, I have a pulse oximeter. They have come down in price and give an oxygen saturation as well as a pulse. However, it's yet one more set of batteries for a device that is somewhat finicky in a number of backcountry settings. I have one, but I am admittedly not 100% sold on it. Remember, early wound cleaning is essential. Early wound closure is not. So, you need to have trained to be able to clean wounds in the backcountry. The most necessary item is clean water. Not sterile, but drinking quality water. 
Unfortunately, on expedition, wounds get contaminated, guaranteed. The dirt, leaves, and other materials can become adhered into the blood, clots, and exudates found in the wound. So you need to apply water with pressure. A large volume syringe with a small tip works well for this task. You will also likely need fine tip tweezers to explore the wound and remove larger foreign particles, small sharp scissors to cut away dead tissue, a magnifying lens to see what the hell you're doing, and a clean toothbrush to scrub away fine particles from the wound. And yes, this hurts. A lot. In addition to these tools, a Kelly clamp or hemostat is a useful item. If this is a new term for you, they look like scissors, but instead of blades, the handles close a small plier-like clamp which can then be locked into position. They are handy for holding gauze pads to sweep material out of a deep part of a wound or holding a skin flap back as you probe to check the wound depth. Lastly, for wounds, you may want some povidone iodine which can be found under the brand name Betadine. As mentioned, this is really only for times that you can't find enough clean drinkable water and have to sterilize water of suspect quality. For starters, let's differentiate between dressings and bandages. A dressing is applied to the wound to maintain an environment which is clean and conducive to healing. It therefore needs to be sterile. A bandage is exterior to the dressing and holds the dressing in place and ideally protects it and the wound from the outside environment. Sterile gauze is the most basic and adaptable dressing. It comes in rolls or pads of various sizes and descriptions. Hydrocolloid dressings are good for more superficial wounds that are not draining significant amounts of fluid. They appear to be self-adhesive gel pads that prevent the wound from drying out and are waterproof on the exterior. They are essentially an artificial scab that protects the wound. An example would be the Tegaderm brand of dressings. For bandaging in the backcountry, the product Vet Wrap is hard to beat. It looks like a thick fibered gauze roll except that it comes in bright, fun colors. It is somewhat stretchy and adheres to itself as you wrap it around a limb. It can be carefully removed and replaced a few times. It is water resistant and really durable. The human version is called Coban. Coban tends to be more expensive and comes in Caucasian skin tone only. So not as much fun. To round out the bandages, remember that you have tensor bandages and triangular bandages as part of your emergency kit. If I'm not worried about space and weight, I carry an extra 1-2 to two tensors and triangulars as part of my main kit. Safety pins always seem to be useful for something, so here they are. Musculoskeletal injuries are also a potential concern on trip. There are a few items that can be helpful for splinting. Already in your kit, you have triangular bandages, tensor bandages, and vet wrap. All are helpful for padding pressure points and splints, as well as holding the rigid components of splints in place. One inch wide utility straps or compression straps with a buckle are also helpful in securing splints. I also carry some long zip ties in my kit for the same reason of securing splints. I will admit that I may take them out since, with all the other options, they've not been very useful. They will go into my repair kit, however, since they have found a place in the field repairing broken canoe seat hangers, expedition pack shoulder straps, and many other things. Finally, for splinting, there is the SAM splint. It is a moldable sheet of aluminum sandwiched between two foam layers. It has a few uses. The obvious one is that it makes splinting a distal upper extremity a cinch. And then there's the stuff that didn't fit under a nice heading. Maybe extra because Mike has anxiety would be a good title. You can see here that I am nervous about being caught without enough examination gloves and Q-tips, which has never happened, as well as Ziploc bags and blister treatments, which happens all the time. The big thing here is a reminder that there are items outside your med kit that will be useful. You may have noted that there was almost no rigid materials in the splinting items. That's because bundles of tent poles, sections of trekking poles, backpack stays, and many other items can be used. So look around. Again, feel free to screenshot this frame to help you begin your own list. My kit is always evolving, so don't take this as gospel. Remember to build a kit for what you do and what you know how to do. So a few of you may be wondering, what about medications? Oh boy, do I carry a lot of drugs. I'm kidding. 
Not about the drugs. I do drag along a lot. I mean that nobody is wondering because I have like five subscribers. Thanks, guys. And YouTube analytics shows that people who do watch my videos stay tuned for like one to two minutes. So no one is here. I'm talking to myself. No, it's fine. Where was I? Right, meds. Here they are. For those that you're not familiar with, you can Google the information on each. You will note the vast majority are for patient comfort. In my context, I often work as a guide taking paying clients out into the backcountry. If space and weight allow, they are right to expect some degree of comfort on trip. You'll also note the absence of strong analgesics. Plainly, I'm not comfortable carrying around opioid painkillers. There is also emerging evidence that high doses of ibuprofen and acetaminophen work as well as Oxycontin for breakthrough pain control in the emergency room. In addition, honestly, if somebody has pain that requires opioids, I need to be working on an evacuation. Also, while you're Googling meds, it's not a bad idea to have laminated cards with the indications, contraindications, and dosages of each. I do. Finally, if you're not a doctor, you need medical direction before you start dispensing drugs to people. So in working with pain clients, they sometimes become injured um, dramatically. This is where that smaller component of the kit that I call the ouch kit comes in. It's the only part of the kit that I let others rummage through if they need something like a regular Tylenol, Tums, or a Band-Aid. Yes, if anyone has watched this far, congratulations. And as your reward, you now know the answer to the question of whether I carry Band-Aids and where. Truly, your life is now complete. From the list, you can see that I stuff a lot in the ouch kit. It really is where all those stupid little things you always seem to need are kept. On that note, for hikes, especially with clients who are not necessarily experienced hikers, blister care. Lots. I keep upping the amount I carry and I keep f***ing running out. In summary, take from this video whatever seems useful to you. Remember, there is no substitute for proper training. Get medical direction whenever you are out of your scope of practice. Build the kit that suits your skill set and environment. Keep modifying it as you learn. Got any neat tricks or useful items that I missed? Let me know in the comments below, or let me know if you have any questions. Also, do me a huge favor and leave a like, you know, as a sacrifice to the almighty algorithm. And subscribe to help me in my drive to, drum roll, nine subscribers. Sweet. Thanks. Cue the royalty-free music.